is Josh Siegel, Curator, Department of Film at the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, and a renowned uh, founder of Film Companion uh, and director of Geo Mami Mumbai Film Festival, television anchor, and an award-winning book author, Ms. Anupma Chopra. They will be discussing the di diversity in programming of how MoMA could be a catalyst to the experience of independent cinemas from India. May I please request Ms. Anupma Chopra and Mr. George Siegel to join on stage. <laughs> the stage is yours, Anupma. How about now? Yep. Yeah, this there is we go. Uh, guys, thank you all for coming. Um, Josh, just to begin with, I want to get a sense of what your job as a curator in the film department of MoMA entails. What do you do? Well, I've been at MoMA for 26 years, which is astonishing to me, but it has been that long. Uh, and my job essentially is the same now as it's always been, which is to uh, canvas the world for, for good films and try to uh, find contexts in which to present them, either in relation to other art forms like paintings and sculptures and photographs and design objects and the other things that MoMA collects, or in the context of MoMA's own history of presenting cinema. The museum is the first in the world to collect and show films. MoMA was founded in 1929 and began collecting and showing films in the 1930s, and it was a very radical idea to call films an art form at that point, certainly at least in, in the United States. Um, and with that came um, a whole host of interesting curators that preceded me, including people like Peter Bogdanovich, the filmmaker, and Donald Ritchie, who was the great uh, scholar of Japanese cinema, who uh, here, for example, Bogdanovich did the first Hitchcock, Orson Welles, and Howard Hawks retrospectives in the world. So essentially, I'm carrying on together with my colleagues the same things that they did, which is uh, we show about 1,200 movies a year. Uh, we show them in the context of retrospectives, uh, exhibitions in the galleries. Uh, we do a number of festivals. I started a festival of film preservation about 17 years ago, which shows restorations from all over the world, including India. Uh, we do New Directors, New Films, which is, I think, probably of most interest to, to people at the Film Bazaar. Uh, festival we've been doing for about 48 years with Lincoln Center uh, to showcase emerging filmmakers from around the world. Uh, we have a documentary festival that also may be of interest that takes place in February. Um, and again, we do premieres of all sorts of films in all genres throughout the year. Josh, your bio says that you um, helped acquire over 600 films for MoMA's permanent collection, uh, which includes many Indian films. So what are some of these Indian films and how do you decide what is worthy and what's not? Well, what is worthy and what's not is it's, it's uh, we like to make errors of commission rather than errors of omission. It's better to err on the side of acquiring work that may not stand the test of time than to neglect to have done so and overlooked films that really the danger is losing films uh, to uh, neglect or deterioration or uh, destruction. And our mission, as it is for all the archives of the world, including the one in Pune, is to collect and restore films that speak to our collective cultural heritage. Um, and I fear that in the 1940s, we faced a disastrous situation in which a lot of the Hollywood studios, for example, destroyed a lot of their films, and many of them no longer exist. The statistic is that 80%, 80% of all of the films made before uh, 1925 no longer exist, maybe even up to 1935. And the fear I have is that the same thing is happening all over again with digital, digitally born work because people don't actually understand how to properly preserve it. 
And if it isn't the mission of an archive to explain it to people, then these films made digitally are going to disappear very quickly. And they already have. I mean, I find sometimes when I'm doing a retrospective and I'm looking for a film that was made even 10 years ago, there's nothing to be found. It doesn't exist. And that's because the studio went out of business, or I should say the distributor, or the small film company went out of business, uh, or the, um, the, the material has deteriorated already. I mean, it's a really perilous situation. So a lot of my job is detective work. Um, as for collecting specifically Indian cinema, we have a very long history of both exhibiting and collecting Indian cinema. Um, and the story I like to tell, which probably some of you already know, is that MoMA had a hand actually in, in producing Pathar Panchali. Because uh, in, the, in the 1950s, a curator working on a show called uh, The Arts and Textiles of India, Monroe Wheeler, was in India doing research on the show. And I think it was John Huston, the filmmaker, uh, who said you should look up this kid named Satyajit Ray. He's working on this film. It sounds extraordinary. He can't finish it. He doesn't have the money. Uh, so Monroe Wheeler went to him and came back and said, this kid is going to be really something. This guy is going to be an amazing filmmaker. We should help support him. So he convinced the trustees to give money for completion funds for the film. And it was with that money that he was able to get um, Ravi Shankar to do the all night uh, recording session for the music. And so. That's amazing. So actually. Come on, guys, a round of applause for that story. I can't take credit for that. <laughs> I can't take credit for it. But, but I have to say that it, it had its world premiere actually at MoMA before it premiered at Cannes. And it, you know, it's fair to say that that was the film that launched Indian cinema on an international scale, just in terms of what people had been missing for so long and not recognizing. Uh, was the richness of Indian cinema, and it was at that point that there was a real turning point took place. And even today, we do provide completion funds for very specific, limited number of film projects. Um, it doesn't happen very often. It often happens with people with whom we have a close relationship. So, for example, uh, Anya Savarda's last two films, we had a hand in funding, Faces, Places, and then the new one about her master class. Uh, and we've worked with other filmmakers who need completion funds, uh, uh, Steven Soderbergh, among others. Um, so again, we're, we try to be as active and, and attuned to what's going on as we can. And I, I came to this film bizarre because I have a particular interest in Indian cinema and also because I like to see the gestation of films and, and, and see how things evolve and stay in touch with filmmakers and producers who are only now getting the funds or hoping to get the funds for their films, but will have finished their films in the next couple of years and to see how things progress. But the completion funds that MoMA offers, so people in this room can't just apply for this. Well, I, I would be misleading if I suggested that you could, you could ask us for, for that kind of money um, because we very, very rarely do it. And we, it's only after we've seen a rough cut that we, uh, we commit to a project and it's, it usually hinges on our special relationship with a particular artist. Um, but I will say that um, we, do, we do offer money in other contexts. So we have theatrical runs of films. Um, one thing we could maybe talk about is the, the diminishing uh, number of distributors in New York and uh, even the diminishing number of cinemas in New York. So MoMA really fills an important gap in, in, in championing films and presenting them over the course of a theatrical run that otherwise would fall through the cracks because distributors are less willing to take risks uh, because of the bottom line. And since we are a nonprofit institution, we don't, we don't worry about a box office. There is no box office. So instead, we invite the filmmaker to, to New York to present the work. Uh, we provide an honorarium. Uh, and through that and then through the potential acquisition, we don't acquire everything that we show, but we acquire a great many works um, that also comes with an honorarium, an artist fee. So um, you're not going to get rich by showing your films at MoMA, but I hope that the imprimatur of MoMA helps um, in, in bringing your films to the attention of other 
uh, places around the United States and beyond. Yeah, my God, what a prestigious place to screen your movie at. So how do they get your attention, Josh? Well, um, we are currently looking at films right now for Doc Fortnite, the documentary festival I mentioned, and for new directors, new films. Uh, These are all for next year, 2020. So Doc Fortnite is in February. It happens every year in February, uh, right after Sundance. So if you're applying to Sundance, it has no bearing on that. You don't have to worry. Um, and then new directors, new films, I just want to say a couple words about, just so you understand how it works. In the past, we had an open call, uh, open submissions. It's a festival run by three curators at MoMA and three curators at Lincoln Center. Because there are only six of us, we realized it was not doing anybody any favors to have an open call where we were getting thousands of submissions because it just was not fair to us and it certainly wasn't fair to the filmmakers. So we, we made the decision to, uh, to end the open call several years ago and now we solicit works through word of mouth or through festival going. Um, uh, through copious amounts of research, through reading reviews by film critics. Um, so have your film shown at other festivals or um, meet with me here. And as I, as I said, I like to cultivate relationships so things don't necessarily happen overnight, but they can take several years, but maybe come to fruition down the line. Um, and if you do get into new directors, we have about a thousand works we look at and there are only 25 films that are ever invited. So it's, it's exceedingly uh, um, discriminating selection, but it's also a very friendly one. Uh, I was just saying earlier that there's no competition, there are no prizes. The whole point is just to actually celebrate the fact that you've, you've made your first or second film uh, and to get to know other filmmakers of your, of your generation in a very non-competitive, friendly setting. And a lot of these filmmakers have gone on to collaborate with each other. Uh, in its history, this has been the festival that showed in New York for the first time everyone from Spike Lee to Pedro Almodovar to Vim Vendors to Chantal Ackerman, um, uh, um, Monty Call, um, and, and so on. So it's a nice launching pad in New York. Um, you don't have to be young to be a new filmmaker. We had Manuel de Oliveira, uh, who died at 103, and had already made about 20 films before he made his debut in New Directors New Films. He was 73 when he made his debut. You don't have to be a first-time filmmaker. You have to be new to New York. And the oh, only thing that so it's not the first film no. necessary. So you can have made you could have made 45 films in Gujarat. Uh, but if they have never been presented in New York, you're new to New York, and therefore you're a new director in New York. Um, and we're very happy to look at your work uh, and, and showcase it. Didn't Oliveira um, have a film in Cannes at 102? Oh, yeah. yeah. He did, right? Everything he made at the end of his life was shown because it was, it was incredible that it even existed at that point. <laughs> Josh, you also started... Um, to save and project, um, which is an initiative that uh, celebrates restoration, preservation from around the world. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, it's, it's an idea I literally stole from, uh, from Bologna. Uh, Bologna has been doing a restoration festival for uh, over 30 years now, and I've been going regularly for a long time, uh, called it Cinema Ritrovato. And I always admired the, the breadth of their, their, their uh, programming. Um, that festival is a much more scholarly based festival and it's a, it's a, it's a lot bigger, it's a lot um, uh, richer and, um, than anything we could hope to do at MoMA, but our festival is about three weeks long, it's in January. Um, we work closely with our archives. We do a lot of restoration work at MoMA, so uh, everything from Hollywood films that the studios themselves uh, destroyed, but we alone saved, like Fox films from the 1920s that otherwise would not have survived, to the films of Andy Warhol, uh, a lot of experimental films, and so forth. Um, so we show films from all over the world. We try to keep up on what the various archives are working on, but also what independent filmmakers are working on. 
Uh, for example, Anya Varda did a lot of her own restoration, restoration work, so, so we would code to her specifically for work. Um, and we've shown films from everywhere from Vietnamese propaganda films of the, of the, during the war to uh, a film shot and now preserved at the Vatican of Pope Pius IX, I want to say, in the turn of the century. Um, it's a pretty eclectic festival. Uh, and a lot of Indian cinema, so uh, Dura Gopala Krishnan or Buddha Devgas Gupta or Manikal, um, tending towards the so-called art cinema, but not necessarily so. Um, uh, we're happy to show all forms of cinema. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be a so-called art film. Um, I, if anything, I'm actually very happily uh, watching very, very mainstream films a lot of the time. So, I was reading an interview you did, Josh, in which you talked about the fact that we all now think that with streaming platforms, all movies are available all the time, but the truth is there's a very small slice of film history. Um, why should we be concerned about this? Well, I think that your, your viewing opportunities are dictated now by Netflix, Amazon, Apple, uh, um, Disney. Disney now. Um, and even within the Disney uh, library, you cannot have access to a great many films in its history that they consider um, offensive or dated. Uh, and it seems to me that you acknowledge your history and you present it and let people draw their own conclusions. I don't think you censor your history and, and whitewash it and present, pretend it never happened. So there are anti-Semitic cartoons in the 30s that, that uh, Disney made. There's Song of the South, which uh, is widely considered a very, um, it plays with a lot of race, racist stereotypes. But these films are speak to their own time. And I think we can't pretend that they weren't made and that they don't exist. I think we understand ourselves a lot better if we try to acknowledge and, and, and uh, confront the past. And so what happens in streaming is that not only are there a great many films that aren't commercially viable, whatever that actually means nowadays, I don't think anyone really knows, but not only not commercially viable, but they also may be insensitive for whatever reason. And I think that that problem, the problem what happens then is that you become self-censoring. So even the films that you make, you're constantly aware of what group it might offend or whether it has any um, viability in the marketplace. Um, and we can't be governed that way. I mean, if you're going to be creators, artistic creators, you have to, to, to trust yourself um, and make the film you want to make. And if it's offensive or if it's... Uh, unsuccessful in other ways, so be it. But it seems to me at least you made the thing you wanted to make and presented it to the world. So I think that my role is to present films to audiences that aren't necessarily going to convince them of their own rectitude. They are not necessarily going to be pleasing films, but they are going to be films that I think are of some interest for some reason or another. Josh, what do you think Indian filmmakers can do to make their films travel more? Well, I think that the key is to make original films, not... I think that the, the, the thing that's dangerous is if you make a film for export, by which I mean films you imagine that would play well in a festival circuit because they reinforce ideas that foreigners may have of your culture. And I think a great many films that do make the rounds do reinforce cliches and stereotypes. That's that may have some play in some festivals. I don't think those are very well-programmed festivals. Um, they don't hold much interest for me. Um, I think this, the more specific, the more um, textural, the more um, uh, rooted they are in your specific uh, um, condition or your own specific history or your own voice, the likelier they are to be of interest. So when people in pitching sessions, and this is not in any way a commentary on the film bazaar specifically, but in general, are, are asked to kind of come up with the two films that they are most like or you know, distill it into a genre, the problem, of course, is that you're basically already f turning your film into a formula that you hope will fit um, some producer or 
um, uh, funder's idea of what would play well in a market. And I think that that's a recipe for disaster. I think that the problem then is that you're just going to end up making, you're going to be beholden to the producer or the, the funder to make the film that they expected you to make. And you're not going to be true to yourself. So if you say your film is, you know, oh, I don't know, whatever, Terminator meets uh, WALL-E, you're kind of stuck. You're pretty much hamstrung in the kind of film that you're now going to be expected to make. And you can't allow yourself the process of discovery that comes with the actual act of filmmaking. But, Josh, it's so hard for anyone starting out, um, you know, to not to say, no, I insist on my own true voice. I mean, Martin Scorsese is now writing op-eds about how difficult it is to, to retain the artistic voice. Uh, in this climate, when, you know, the, the whole conversation is if film is film anymore or is it all just content, uh, what should somebody who wants to be an artistic creator do? Well, I think using the word content is the most depressing thing I could imagine. I know, I, mean, I know, I hear you. It's not content, it's a film. Um, and so if you're in that in that world, in that language, then you've already, we have a serious problem because I don't do, I don't show content. Um, I show art. And um, I realize it's exceedingly difficult. I mean, we're here at a film bazaar in an effort to help realize your films to make sure that they get made. And I always admire anyone who just makes a film to begin with, who's even able to make a film. It's a huge accomplishment. And then to have to sell your film and market your film and hustle, I mean, that's a whole different muscle that you have to exercise. And some people are good at it and some people aren't. That doesn't mean that your film isn't good. It just means you're particularly good at networking. And I find it even more daunting for filmmakers these days because there's, the outlets are so uncertain, right? I don't mean to be totally pessimistic here, by the way. This is, sounds too depressing. But I do think in some ways the streaming platforms have made it, um, have opened up new avenues, potentially opened up new avenues. Um, but I like to think that places like MoMA and the equivalent uh, cinemas in, in, um, around the world, but in India, are not going to go anywhere anytime soon. Um, Netflix itself is thinking about buying a cinema that just closed in New York called the Paris Theater, which is a theater I grew up going to. It's a wonderful theater. And they're considering buying it. Actually, they've made an offer to buy it. And it's not just with the recognition that they need a place to get Academy consideration, but it's also the recognition that a lot of filmmakers they work with want to have their films shown on a big screen. So, you know, Noah Baumbach and, and Scorsese uh, and countless others. Um, Tarantino and others, you know, they want to have their film shown the way they're meant to be shown. And so I don't think anything that we're doing is going away. I think that, you know, you have to be tenacious and you have to be, believe in the project you've made. But I do believe in my heart of hearts that the best work will find its way to the right eyes eventually. I mean, you as the head of a festival and also as a, as a film critic know that a lot of what we do is talk to people and we get insight into what is being done in a particular country or what interesting things are happening in Tasmania. Um, I don't know what's being made in Tasmania, to be honest, but I just made that up. Um, you know, and so a lot of it's just about conversations, and then as long as we keep the conversations open, you know, we'll find out about your film eventually. I, I really believe that. You have to keep faith. Keep the faith. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Josh, you are considered one of the foremost film curators in the world. Uh, where did this love for cinema begin? Uh, I mean, I, I grew up going to double bills. Um, I don't know if they had double bills in India, actually. Come Two films back to back? Yeah, did they do that? Not that I Not remember. Really. Did, did we? Has anybody seen that? Double bills. So no. I always think of, so there are cinemas I grew up in, in Manhattan in the Upper West Side and I always associate certain films with each other. Um, so for example, Holiday and Bringing Up Baby I always remember seeing together or Day at the Races and Night at the Opera, the Marx Brothers films. And so films for me always came in pairs when I was a kid. And I honestly, I mean, I, I grew up going to a lot of cultural things in New York, but nothing excited me more than going to see movies. And so 
I feel incredibly lucky that I, you know, I don't get to see movies all day, much as I would like to, much as my wife thinks. Um, it's not that glamorous. It's mostly sending lots and lots and lots of emails, uh, endless numbers of emails. Um, but it is pretty great to get to watch movies, and as you would, I think, agree. I love it. I, yeah. I know people just, but people do think that it's easy because they're like, "Well, what do you do? You just watch movies for a living." But the amount of bad films I have to sit through, I don't know how it is for you. Oh, it's the same. <laughs> <laughs> Josh, just a final word of advice for our filmmakers out there, not so much about making a film, but about that hustle, uh, about that marketing. You know, are there any key festivals that they should look at? What, because we don't really have people who are advising young aspiring filmmakers where to take their movies. So what's like a basic piece of th advice that you can give them? Well, I, I, the one thing I would do is find the people um, in your community who go to festivals um, and have a sense, you know, it's, it's difficult to say what festivals should be noteworthy because it changes every, gen every few years depending on who's, it totally depends on the personality of the person running the festival. So I would have said, for example, when Simon, uh, um, the Viennale is an interesting festival because it's singularly curated. It's a really curated show. Uh, uh, um, and, and, you know, if you, this is, again, not to say anything um, bad about Venice, Berlin, and Cannes, but there are things that go beyond those places. So and even in, within Cannes, if you look at Acid, Acid is a very interesting kind of independent program, or uh, the Cannes des Realisateurs, which is an independent program that's kind of of but not with the rest of Cannes, uh, or the sidebars of the Berlin Al. So I think one thing I would recommend is try to find programmers in festivals whose uh, sensibility you share or you think you share and approach them directly. Don't worry about sending a film into some sort of vast pool of films through, I don't even know what they do now, it's not without a box anymore, but anyway, with these kind of open submissions, I think that the key is Find the, the people who you think we're going to, are going to um, cotton to your work. And so if you find a subsection in the Berlinale of um, the panorama, let's say, go to that specific programmer and say, hey, I have this film that I really think you would like, you in particular. Flattery gets you everywhere, by the way. So I really think you like it. I see that last year you showed these fantastic films and these are some So do your research on the program. Do your research, yeah. I mean, really, that's the key, is to find the specific person that will listen to you. But sending things into the, into the, into the void, to me, is, is, is too nebulous. Um, do your research, really. And don't, they, and, and, yeah. and don't despair. I mean, you know... There are a lot of festivals that aren't the major ones that are excellent, um, that are terrific programming uh, in Mexico, for example, um, Bafisi in Argentina. Um, you know, don't, don't limit yourselves in the kind of festivals you reach out to and don't assume that um, your work, your film is not appropriate for a festival because you never know. Right. And with MoMA, the information would be on the website of how they can uh, enter the yeah, I mean, I have a feeling I'm now going to get 3,000 emails. You are. <laughs> um, but, but um, yeah, you can find out about the various programs we do on our website. And I, one last thing I wanted to say is that, you know, MoMA just had a new uh, expansion. It's, 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 I must say, it's incredibly beautiful right now. Um, and there's much more of a presence of, of films in the galleries themselves, so films alongside paintings and, and photographs. Um, so I would say also that any, any of you who work in um, installations who aren't limited solely to theatrical work but also work with galleries or work in um, uh, film, film installations should also keep MoMA in mind because we do a lot of that as well. And also a lot of performance. Um, we have a whole department devoted to performance. Uh, so if you're, if you're a filmmaker who also works in dance or if you're a filmmaker who projects during uh, some other kind of uh, performance also keep us in mind. We're really open to everything.
How wonderful. That sounds great. Thank you so much. Course, my pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you. All. Thank you. I'm happy to, if you want to, I know we don't have much time on this stage, but if you want to ask me any questions, you can come up to me later. Oh, I don't know if we can do it now. Do we have time? Nancy, do we have time? Can we ask questions? Yeah. Okay, yes, of two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> can we get mics out or do you just want to? Sh okay. I should also mention, by the way, that my boss, the chief curator of my department, Rajendra Roy, is half Indian, so that also helps, I suppose. Um, he's also half Dutch, so if you're half Dutch and half Indian, you really have a good in at MoMA. Yeah. Hi. Uh, you spoke about how uh, Netflix is buying the theater in New York. Now, uh, since uh, you know the ground realities in the USA, and I'm not, I can't remember the exact decade, but when uh, the court ruling was there in the US, somewhere... When the what? Uh, there was a court ruling somewhere in the middle of the 20th century where they said that major Hollywood studios can't own theaters. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what are your thoughts about that court ruling and what's happening right now with Netflix and the theater Well, it's funny you should bring it up because the Supreme Court, they're trying to actually turn back that law because they think that that paradigm doesn't pertain anymore because of streaming. So there, there was a time when there was a law, an antitrust law, that prevented the studios from owning cinemas. Uh, because it became a monopoly and it pushed out a lot of the independent filmmakers. But that actually is now being questioned because of streaming. Um, the studios are so against the ropes right now and the theaters are even more against the ropes, they're even more in trouble that they're trying to find ways of salvaging it by um, ending that kind of idea that it's, a, it's an antitrust situation. Um, Listen, I think any opportunity to show films on a big screen to an audience is cause for celebration. And I'm glad that Netflix, I have nothing against Netflix, really. I think they're producing amazing work and I think they're working with great filmmakers and they were willing to give money to Scorsese to make The Irishman when no one else was. Um, so if they're even open to the idea of showing their films in cinemas, fantastic. Hi. Yeah, I mean, actually, I am. Uh, Minakshi Shede, uh, I'm South Asia the delegate to the Berlin Film Festival. We met at your office, yes, Minsk. Uh, two two part question. One is uh, you talked about a film not being premiering in New York, and that would make it eligible. So we have New York Indian Film Festival, which regularly has been showing for a long time. So does that automatically eliminate uh, showing there? That's the I would leave it out. The other part I wanted to ask is what is what is the response you've had to? any film, any Indian film or South Asian film that has had a huge response other than the great generation of the Ray and Adur, any of the younger ones, which of the Indian films or South Asian films have had any particular response at, uh, with your audiences? Well, I mean, I would say uh, the answer to your first question is yes, it would, it would eliminate you from, from eligibility to have your film shown in any festivals or even in any theatrical venues in New York uh, before new directors. That's the one criteria we have is that we want to be able to have a New York premiere. Um, I myself don't really love the idea of premieres. I think it's, it's kind of awful uh, to compete with other festivals, but that's the reality because we also have to get an audience. We have to sell tickets and if it's already been making the rounds, it's very hard to get an audience. Um, having said that, you know, we, we, just to throw out a couple titles because I know we don't have much time. I mean, we, we, uh, in the last few years of new directors showed films like uh, Tilly and Court um, uh, and uh, I'm trying to think of other recent ones. Um, there was another. Uh, it slipped my mind, I'm sorry. In any case, um, there's a lot of, I mean, you know, I did a series some years ago of, of contemporary Indian cinema. If you go on the web, on MoMA's website, again, I don't want to, throw out a bunch of names, but if you go on MoMA's website, you can see there are two programs of Indian contemporary Indian cinema um, that I program with Uma Dakuna, who may be here right now, but um, Uma is a great resource, by the way, to all of you in terms of what's going on in the festival world and how you might position your films uh, for festivals. Uh, but in any case, um, those were intentionally as, as um, uh, as diverse as Indian cinema is diverse. I mean, it captured in a very, very modest way um, the, the various regions of Indian cinema and the various languages it's, and genres. Yeah. I think that's all we have time for. Yeah, Lance, Thank says you says no more. <laughs>
Thank you all. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Josh. Thanks.